want to welcome our uh, Face for Radio audio only podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, yada yada, blada blada, whatever whatever the case may be, we'd love to have you uh, join us over here on True Word Faith for Life with Dr. Sean Channel. That would be an awesomely cool thing, and uh, we would be honored to have it. But we're just happy to have you whichever way you're going to listen to us. If you're on iTunes, maybe you could do a recommend or click on the um, the little button they have there for thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber to the True Word Faith for Life uh, channel, maybe click on subscribe and click on the little bell. That would be awesome. So here we go. This is one of three, part one of three, Faith Under Fire, trusting God through suffering, silence, and opposition, trusting God, trusting God through silence, through suffering and opposition. So this first part of the series, and uh, this series dives deep into one of the hardest struggles that real believers face, trusting God when life feels unbearable. It un- feels unfair. It, it, it feels unpredictable. It's in these moments of suffering and silence and opposition that doubt and fear often creep in. They lead us to question our faith, our purpose, and even God's presence. So today we're going to explore the Hebrew scriptures and how these ancient truths, when examined through their cultural and historical lenses, speak directly to our modern day. And, you know, you can call them struggles, challenges, whatever you want to call them, to our, the things we go through, our hurts, habits, and hangups as believers in the modern day. We're going to uncover a deeper meaning of suffering, God's purpose behind the silence, and how faith can thrive even when the world seems to be pressing in. So I'm glad to have you joining me as we embark on this journey to discover what it means to have faith under fire and to trust God in the moments when he seems the furthest away. So I also want to welcome the folks in chat. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Kim. Hey, classmate. And uh, so glad to have you. Honored to have you. Uh, Thank you to everyone who is listening. I don't know if you know on the True Word Faith for Life, you have the ability to do uh, to join the chat and uh, let us know. By the way, let us know uh, how it sounds too loud, uh, too quiet, whatever the case may be. You let me know and I will make adjustments as I know how. So here we go. Oh, so I forgot to say, um, and this is important. If um, I will, I. I may record, let me look and see here. Let me see. I may record next week. I won't be able to be live next week uh, on Sundays with Dr. Sean, but uh, let me know in chat if you'd prefer I wait, or I can record it during this week and set it to, uh, you know, uh, post at the same time on Sundays with Dr. Sean. So it'll still be there. That would be part two. And then, but I'll be back live November 3rd. I think November 3rd is the Sunday. So let's get started. The problem of suffering and evil. The problem of suffering and evil. The question of suffering is one. Thank you, Colleen. Colleen, the unpaid sound tech has indicated that the sound is good. So thank you very much for that. So the question of suffering is one that's echoed throughout the ages, or at least for as long as I can remember. Now, I have a brain injury, and sometimes I can't remember five minutes ago. Sometimes I can't remember 30 seconds ago. But I do have a memory that goes back a little bit, and sometimes I can remember those things. And I have to tell you that for me, there we go. Man, it's blasting me out here. Um, That for me, this has always been a struggle, right? Because I used to raise money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. and. there for a time, I was a financial and estate planner, and it did, we did trust and estate planning. And sometimes we would run across people who had millions and millions of dollars, didn't know what to do with it. And they'd say, hey, I don't want to leave it to my kids, or maybe they didn't have any children. So I would say, hey, I just have the place for you. So we would carry them down there, let them see what happens there and why, the why and how of what happens. And we would, it was exciting. It was a, a cool thing. But every time I went there, I bawled my eyes out. So as a believer, even, you know, back in my very much younger days, I always struggled with this question. Why does a good and loving God, why does the good and loving God 
allow suffering. I always, always struggled with it. And maybe this is the same question you have. Hey, Anna, from across the pond, how are you? Good, good to see you. Thank you for listening on Facebook Live. Thank you to those who are listening on Twitch and Instagram and and, um, LinkedIn and Quora and X. Thank you so much to all of you who are listening. And if you're listening on the backup channel for the True Word Faith for Life, the YouTube backup channel, um, if you want to just go over to, if you haven't subscribed on the main channel, that will be awesome. Because I think there's about 300 and some folks over there. And uh, that will get us close to a th- closer to 1,000. And well, there's a lot of good stuff that happens once you hit 1,000. So anyway, um, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if you've struggled with this or not. You don't have to admit it. I mean, um, Tommy Robinson, yes. Yeah, Tommy Robinson over in the UK is about to be arrested, it seems. Yeah, we will definitely pray for him. He's, um, he's fighting the good fight, good lands, fighting the good fight. So why does a good and loving God allow suffering, whether it's a hurricane or hurricanes? You know, they took my, my friends, my dear friends, and some of my relatives, oh, gone twice. Ruined twice. Just taken away. And, and, and my one friend, you know, Daniil, uh of Seahag Marina in Steenhatchee, Florida, took her business away twice. It takes millions and millions of dollars to, to bounce back from that each time. So maybe it's a personal or a physical pain. Maybe it's an injustice or a loss. You know, suffering... It shakes us to the core, and, and it can lead us to doubt God's goodness. And I, I, I have to say, in my case, any of the suffering that, you know, even the suffering that was not self-inflicted. Now, I, I did a whole lot of self-inflicted things. Um, my fault completely. My fault completely. You know, totally on me. I earned it. I earned it. God shouts to us in our pain, and he whispers to us in our pleasure. And there's lots of times that I deserve the shouting. I would say lots and lots and lots of times. So, so there we have it, right? We've got this doubt. We've struggling with it. We don't know what to do with it. Well, I've got some ideas. In Romans 8, 28, this is how we're instructed. Furthermore, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called in accordance with his purpose. Let's read this again. Let's make sure we are hearing it clearly. Furthermore, in other words, he's adding to, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called in accordance with his purpose. We often take this to mean something very different than what is intended, right? It's very easy to kind of kind of proof text that and make it make it mean something that it doesn't. But I'm going to give you the real deal. So, while Romans was originally written in Greek, absolutely, that's indisputable, understanding the Hebrew mindset and cultural context between behind uh Shaul or Paul's message gives a deeper meaning to the passage. Right? It gives it the meaning. So Paul, being a Hebrew, being a Jew, deeply rooted in the Jewish tradition, often conveyed concepts that resonated with Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and Jewish thought. See, it's important for us to understand that, because if we don't understand that, you've got to know, my new book is out. Thank you, by the way, to Kim for purchasing my book. I'm excited for you to have it. And um, all of you out there who purchased the book, I'll be honest, the hardcover is a premium hardcover. We made a, a, a challenging decision to, to go for quality, to have a book that's going to last on your shelf and on, you know, wherever you have it, if you pass it around to people or maybe encourage them to buy their own copy. If you write in it, you take notes, maybe you come back to the show and say, hey, you know, I have a question. Or maybe you, you contact me through any of the number of, of places you can contact me that are indicated in the book. We wanted it to be able to stand up to that. So it's not cheap, but I didn't want to have to apologize for poor quality. You can also get the, the ebook, but, um, but you can get both, certainly. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kim. Kim says it's a good read. Make sure to leave a, a review. Once we get on um, 
We're supposed to be on Amazon and all the other booksellers. I don't know why we're not. I did a search earlier and it, it just didn't, uh, it didn't pop up, but uh, I don't know. But we'll figure that out. We'll get all that figured out. So key themes in Hebrew thought. It's so important to understand. Let me take this off here. You know what? It's loud when, uh, when you do stuff. These mics are so sensitive. I don't know if you know that. They are so sensitive. Oh, goodness, I'm all tangled. Let's get her done here. I'm not the most co- coordinated nowadays. It's a nice jacket. I like it, but I'm completely tangled. Those of you who are on uh, YouTube, any of the YouTube channels, you get to see the massive struggle that a, a completely handicapped guy goes through just trying to take his jacket off. Isn't that fun? Wasn't that exciting? Wasn't that worth the, worth the price of admission? Which, by the way, is zero. Anyway, thank you for indulging me on that. I was about to roast. So, providence and sovereignty of God. This is something that we struggle with because it's not something that typically we get. Right? The providence and sovereignty of God. You know, our country, I think in the United States of America, now it's not speaking for the UK. I can't speak for any of the other countries of the folks that are listening. But I can say this. Sovereignty is something that seems hotly debated. What does that mean? And, um, you know, I have said, and, and uh, the current GOP candidate for president has said, and many other very, very reasonable people have said, if you don't have a border, you don't have a country. So if there's, if there's no border at all, there's no stipulations of what you have to do in order to come into the country, then you don't have a country. And so sovereignty for us is a, is a real challenge. Now, let me say this. Providence, you know, provide, from which provide comes, providence is something that we do get. We absolutely do get it. We get that. With things being provided for us, people providing for us, providing for ourselves. And, and I think to some degree, we make the mistake of not fully getting how God provides for us, right? That's, that's a hard concept. So in the Hebrew Bible, which they've had the scriptures for thousands of years longer than us, the Jews have, and we should respect that. We should re- respect the fact that it's in their original language and culture. The concept of God's providence, how, how that is in Hebrew, it's rendered in Hebrew, is hashgacha. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this slow. Hashgacha pratit. Hashgacha pratit. So, that refers to God's ongoing personal involvement in the world. Now, this is seen throughout Scripture, where God uses every circumstance, both good and bad. Hey, you know, you got to take the bad with the good. Right? So we, it's very easy for us. Hey, John, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining from YouTube. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. If you haven't hit the, the uh, subscribe and, and uh, the little bell and all that, I'd love for you to do that. Anybody that's listening that, that hasn't done that, we, we just absolutely love that. So this is seen throughout Scripture where God uses every circumstance, both good and bad, to fulfill his divine purpose. Joseph's life in Genesis. Look, we know Joseph, right? Coat of many colors, all of that. His life in Genesis is one of the most direct parallels. After being sold into slavery, betrayed and imprisoned, Joseph reflects in Genesis 50-20. Now, let me say this. Some of you might say, wow, there's parts of this that you've had in other messages that you've given, other teachings. Well, let me tell you why we're here. We're blessed to have you here, uh, John, in Afternoon Church. It's, it's wonderful to have you. We're honored to have everybody listening. It means a lot to me. Love your participation in chat, too, by the way. So, I want to say this. Uh, the reason I'm doing this more elaborate teaching, originally I was going to teach on First and Second Samuel, the kings and judges and so on. I'm going to do that in a future Sundays with Dr. Sean. I, I, I couldn't believe how many questions I was getting about these topics what I'm speaking about now. So I said, you know what, maybe, maybe this warrants a deeper teaching. So let's go to Genesis 50, 20. You mean to do me harm, but God meant it for good 
so that it would come about as it is today with many people's lives being saved. You meant to do me harm, but God meant for it good. Meant it for good, so that it would come about as it is today with many people's lives being saved. Listen, Paul's or Shaul's Jewish audience would have understood the sovereignty of God. They understand these concepts. They live those concepts. And how he works through suffering, through difficulty, and human plans to bring about his perfect will. Now, there is Tov, T-O-V, Tov, 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 T-O-V, in, you know, English letters. The Hebrew concept of good. The word good, agathos, in Greek, good, agathos. So, in the Greek New Testament, it mirrors the Hebrew word tov, which means good. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Right? Means good. But it carries a rich connotation in Jewish thought. See, this is why it's so important to dig deeper in the original languages, because if we don't do that, we don't get those nuances. And you say, well, I like the explanation I'm given. I like what the preacher said. Uh, hey, listen, I don't want you to argue with what the preacher says. I don't want you to, to have a fuss with them or, you know, whoever you're learning from. I don't want that to happen. But it is important to understand the original context. And the, the, the connotation here in Jewish thought, the idiomatic expression, all of these things, the words they use for a reason. So it's important to get this. So in, in the Hebrew Bible, tov is used to describe something that aligns with God's design and purpose. Not just good, but good because it aligns with God's design and God's purpose in Genesis 1 after each act of creation. Listen, you want to write, write this down. Unless you're flying the, one of the, the, the SpaceX ships. By the way, um, I hope all, some of y'all have gotten to see that darn comet streaking across the sky every night. I seem to miss it every time, but I have friends that have taken pictures of it. I don't know when it's going to go by tonight, if it's going to go by, but I know we're going to have a clear sky. I sure like to see it. Anyway, I all said to say this. Genesis 1, after every act of creation, God, cre- God declares it good. Well, what's that word he uses? Tov. Which means, this, what I have done, is functioning according to my divine order. God's divine order. Thus, good in the Jewish mindset isn't just a subjective well-being. It's something that serves God's ultimate and eternal purposes. So, so much deeper. So, when Paul says that God works everything for good, it reflects God's ability to bring situations into alignment with His divine will, even when those situations seem tragic or chaotic from our human perspective. I don't know how many times you've been at a funeral. I mean, I've preached a lot of funerals, and and I'll be honest, it's tricky. It's tricky to preach preach funerals. It's 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 hard to do. Especially if I, hey Miss Sharon, good to have you. Scott, you're supposed to be comp uh campaigning, brother. Or maybe you're taking today off. I don't know, but I'm glad to have you. Miss Sharon, it's so nice to have you. Yes, the Virginia Creek Ministries in Surf City are wonderful. Love them. Love Pastor and Miss Kathy. Love them, love them, love them. Amen. So, even when I'm standing there and I'm preaching a funeral, if I know that that person is a believer, they've placed their faith in Christ, I know where they are. I know their destiny. I know what they're going to be experiencing. But it is sad. It's terrible. It's awful. One day I will close my eyes to last. I'm told I don't, you know, I don't have, I should be buying green bananas, get my fares in order. Well, okay. And one day when I close my eyes to last, I hope some of y'all will miss me, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to be in heaven. I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt about God's promises and providence in my life. He has redeemed me when I didn't deserve it. And I never will. I will never deserve it, but he did it, and I am so thankful for it. Amen. Those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, I'd love for you to take that perspective to say, hey, you know what? I am so thankful. By the way, Scott, thank you for that comment on the background. Um, Miss Colleen liked it too. I figured, you know what? If I can figure out how to replicate this, I'm going to do it again. Amen. So I've preached funerals where um, I gave. 
the plan of salvation. I, and I talked to the people and I looked at the casket and no matter what the circumstance was, I said, you know, hey, this is a tragic and terrible thing. None of us, none of us want this tragedy in our lives. None of us want that. But circumstances put this person here, maybe circumstances out of their control. And then I've, I've preached uh, some, some um, folks that were drug addicted drug addicted folks, heroin and other drugs. And unfortunately, the heroin was tainted with, uh, not tainted, it was spiked with, with fentanyl and, and the person died. It was horrible. And preaching her funeral. But she and I had had many conversations, even at her tender age of 23 years old, we'd had many conversations over the last three years about her faith. And she assured me that she had placed her faith in Christ. So. Even though I'm I'm terribly sad to not see her again, my heart was broken, at the same time, I knew where she was. But I spoke to the audience, which was full of her fellow addict friends. And you could tell. And I said, listen, if you're sitting there and you're looking at the casket, and you're saying, my God, she looks horrible. And she did. That was her mother. I think it was genius. Her mother said, I didn't want the... The, um, I wanted an open casket, and I wanted them to show how terrible she looked at her death. Because I wanted to try to scare them, to shake those fellow drug addicts who claim to be her friend, into quitting, into stopping, into getting treatment, whatever the case may be. But I'm telling you, even preaching that funeral, I knew that she was redeemed and made whole and healed of her addiction, and she was with the Father. I've preached other funerals where I knew the dear, dear people. Hey, Brother Martin, love you, brother. Good to see you. Everybody pray for Martin. He needs our prayers in every aspect, and we're honored to do that. So I've preached other funerals where, you know what? Good land. Crushing. Utterly crushing that this person was gone from my life. Yet, I knew. That they were in the presence of heaven. They were, they were with God. They were healed and made whole. Oh my goodness. How much better does it get than that? I don't think there's any way that you can describe it any better than that. They were healed and made whole. One day God is going to heal me and make me whole. I don't think it's going to be here on, on this mortal plane. But I know that he's going to do it there. And we're going to have to go through some, through some trials and tribulation. We're going to go through some, through some struggles. Scott, thank you very much for praying for Martin and lifting him up. I appreciate that. I know that you do. I know you're a praying man. So love and covenant loyalty. Man, that's a tricky thing. Achava. Achava. The phrase, those who love God. Achava. You say, how's that a phrase? That You said one thing. You made one sound. Yeah, I know. That's why you got to understand Hebrew. Aramaic and Greek, because there are, there are big differences, right? And then we go, then we go the game of telephone with the string that's broken to English, and, and we get it all mixed up. So the phrase, those who love God, it's a powerful concept, and it's rooted in the Hebrew word for love, ahava, ahava. It's often associated with covenantal loyalty. In Deuteronomy 6.5, the Shema. The Shema, I've done a preaching on the Shema. It's free to listen to under the live tab. God commands Israel, Israel, to love Adonai your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And then remember what Yeshua adds to that. If you go to that teaching, I'll explain all of that and why he added that. Why he was empowered to add, to establish scripture, the word of God. So, in the Hebrew context, loving God is deeply connected with a faithful obedience and trust in His covenant promises. Listen, we say, I love you, I love you, I love you, right? Maybe we were a very misbehaving, uh, disobedient child. We say, I love you, love you, love you. And guess what? We don't obey our parents, right? I love you, love you, love you to our spouse, but we're, we're unkind to our spouse. That could be akin to obedience to God's will, violating that obedience. God doesn't want us doing that. So here's the thing. This is the really, really important thing. If you've 
Get only one thing from this, get this. Maybe write this one in ink. If you are a child of a parent and you don't, you don't obey your parent. Oh, I've got a newsflash for you. It's tricky and it's tough. It's tricky and it's tough for a parent to look at a child that completely misobeys, disobeys all the time. It's such a challenge. Faithful obedience and in God's way of thinking is deeply connected. If you love God, you will obey Him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Remember that little old song? Come on, if you've ever been to Sunday school, you remember that song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It's so simple. It is so simple, and yet so difficult for all of us. Anyway, so I want you to get that, that that is, the reference is there for a reason. So therefore, Paul's reference, or Shaul, Paul's reference to those who love God, it speaks not just to an emotional affection. Oh, I love God. I love God. I love God. Right? Emotions lie. What do you do? It speaks to not just emotion. Not just a, 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 a whipped up emotionalism, but to a relational, covenantal commitment, trusting God, even, I would even say, especially when his ways are not clear, especially when his ways are not clear to us. There's a Hebrew word, kara, kara. The phrase called in accordance with this purpose refers to the Hebrew concept of divine calling, kara. In the Old Testament, being called by God was not simply about personal vocation, but a response to God's mission and will for his people. Did you know that if your name is Kara or Kara, and it's spelled K-A-R-A, that is a Hebrew word. And it, and it, it means, it refers to a, the concept of divine calling, Kara. Being called by God, it's not, it's not just about your vocation. It's a response to God's mission and will for his people. This concept of calling, it's, it's, it's strange to us. I don't know that we necessarily understand it. It's linked to God's sovereign choice of individuals or a nation for a specific purpose, like the calling of Abraham or Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. We're going to talk more about that in a second, but look at my own life. Maybe you can look at your own life. I would have never chosen me. For this. If I was God, I would never have called me. I don't, I don't deserve this. I surely don't deserve this. And maybe you know somebody who is in ministry, who teaches and preaches, and you say, man, I knew them way back when. I don't think I would. I, I, I doubt that they deserve that calling. I'm not going to listen to them because I remember how they were. You know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God calls who he calls. And one day he's going to call you to something. It may not be this. It may be a simple thing. The question is, do you do it? Well, God, I don't like that thing that you're calling me to. I want to wait and get something else. That's not how it works. I resisted this, this, all this. I resisted writing books. I resisted preaching and teaching, traveling, all those things. I resisted all those things. I did not want to do it. Why? Because I said, God, I don't deserve this. I can't believe that you would call me, are you absolutely sure you've seen how I've lived my life? Lord, I just don't think you're calling the right Sean. Maybe it's an S-E-A-N or an S-H-A-U-N. Not S-H-A-W-N, me. Must have been one of the other Sean. But no, that's not what he does. He knows who he's calling. So Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where God promises to bless him, make him a blessing to all nations. Paul is speaking to the reality that God calls his people according to his divine purpose, a purpose that ultimately, though we may not see it right now, serves his kingdom and redemptive plan for humanity. What about Job? I mentioned him earlier, faith under fire. Let me tell you what, consider Job a righteous man who lost everything, yet continued to trust in God. 
In Job 13, 15, Job declares, this is, this is Job saying this. This is Job expressing this out loud. Look, he will kill me. I don't expect more, but I will still defend my ways to his face. The Hebrew word, yachal, yachal, meaning to wait or hope. Now, at some point, I'm going to learn how to put those words in Hebrew up on the screen for just a moment, and you'll see them, how they're written in Hebrew, right? I want to, I want to be able to do that. It's tricky with Ecamm Live. I'm learning it as I go. So, um, you know, be patient with me. I'm a work in progress. But the Hebrew word yachal, mean, it, it means to wait or to hope. So it expresses Job's unwavering trust, even in the face of unimaginable suffering and loss. Look, he will kill me. I don't expect more, but I will still defend my ways to his face. He, he was confident. He said, look, I, I am obedient to God, and I have a hope, and I'm willing to wait for God to establish that purpose in my life, in my family's life. He was unwavering. Unwavering in the face of unimaginable pain and suffering and loss. In the ancient Near Eastern mindset, which is what this is, suffering was often seen as a punishment from the gods. Remember, the whole idea of of a monotheistic god is just so out there. Right? So they still, you know, it's a wild, wild land. Very important to remember that. Yet Job's story challenges this idea. Suffering's not always the result of sin. Job's faith teaches us that suffering can be a test of faith, a refining process where God's silence is part of a greater purpose. And oh, man, do we hate when that happens. I remember Pastor Latour. He was the superintendent of our school I went to for a couple of years. Christian school called Lewis Christian Academy in Lewis, Delaware. Pastor Latour was one of the greatest men I've ever known, and I I met him just in time and for just long enough to learn some things from him. And I remember, I remember one time, you know, he adored his wife and he adored his children. And I remember him tears streaming down his face. He he was preaching a, a chapel and he said, I pray God doesn't challenge me on this, test me on, do you love me more than you love your family? Do you love me more than your wife, more than your children? That's the real thing. None of us want that. I've always said, I've always said, y'all, I have always said, oh Lord, let me predecease my children. Don't let me lose a child. Oh, I, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. I don't want any of them to have to deal with that with their children. No way. You know what? We rarely, though, We rarely see that purpose when we're going through incredible trials and tribulations. I believe Pastor Latour, when he said, hey, I don't don't want to be tested that way. And I pray that I stand faithful. When I am, I pray that I stand faithful. And then I trust God through the trials and tribulations. Oh, Lord, please, but don't test me in this way. I I pray you don't test me. I beg you not to. For us today, when we feel the pain of unanswered questions, Job's story reminds us to keep trusting God, to keep trusting God, to keep trusting God, even and especially when we don't understand the why. Now we have Yeshua suffering. This is a new meaning. The cross is the ultimate symbol of God bringing good from suffering. In Isaiah 53, 3, you say, man, preacher, you sure do use the Old Testament a lot. Look, if you don't understand the Old Testament, you will never accurately understand the new. In Isaiah 53, 3, the prophet himself writes about the suffering servant. This was a foreshadowing to Yeshua. People despised and avoided him, a man of pains well acquainted with illness. Like someone who pe- whom people turned their faces, he was despised. We did not value him. Yeshua the Mahamashiach. Yeshua Hamashiach. Yeshua Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah. He was fully acquainted with sorrow and suffering. His pain was not meaningless. It was redemptive. Today, Yeshua's suffering reminds us that God whispers to us in in our pleasures. And he shouts to us in our pain. You know, we, we never learn 
when we see the light. You know, you can't see it, but there's a bunch of lights in here, right? And they're hot. That's why I take my shirt off. I'm hot. Not in that kind of way. Not in H-O-T-T kind of way. But I'm hot, as in temperature. Well, here's the thing. I don't consider this a suffering. You don't, you don't see these things. You don't see all these things going on. There's all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes. You don't see it. There's a big old screen and keyboards and, and a phone and, and a controller and another computer. There's two computers and there's all kinds of wires. And my goodness, my lands, you might not see the things. In my, there's all kinds of things we don't see that make things happen. God whispers to us in our pleasures. And he shouts to us in our pain. There are many times that I thought to myself, Lord, I don't know that I need another pain. I don't want another pain in my life. Oh, I deserve it. You're absolutely right. I deserve it. But I don't want it. I don't want to go through it again and again. But here's the thing. God doesn't waste pain. Instead, he uses it to refine our character to draw us closer to Him, and to bring about a greater good we often see later on, but we can't see it in that moment. Look, I want to show you something. My dear, lovely sister, I call her my sister, my sister-in-law, but I still love her like a sister, gave me, she knows I collect Bibles, she gave me my grandfather's Bible. Can you believe it? Look at that. Gave me this beautiful Bible. It's so old. Is so old, it's going to have a place of reverence. You say, what in the world does that got to do with anything? That must be a squirrel. No. No, because that man went through suffering. This was given to my, uh, my uh, pop-op, what I used to call him, uh, pop-op Henry. And uh, my mom referred to him till the long after he died as daddy. And, and she was honored to give him that Bible. My dad and and my mom gave him that Bible in 1971. Not many years after that, he passed away at a relatively young age. He didn't need to die. And I remember the suffering that my mother went through. It was horrible. It's hard to see. It's hard to see. It's hard to see any purpose in any of those things, any of those sufferings, any of those shouts. Oh, my lands, we can't often see it in the moment. God is not indifferent to your suffering, to your suffering. Deborah, so nice to have you. Thank you so much for joining. God is not indifferent to your suffering. He uses it in ways we may never fully understand this side of the veil, in this life. We may not understand it, and that's okay. We have to be okay without understanding everything. I love something that Elon Musk said the other day. I believe God is working on him. Elon Musk said the other day, one of the smartest people in the world, clearly the the wealthiest man in the world, but certainly one of the smartest in the top three, I would say. And I heard him say something the other day. He he said, I'm not going to understand everything. There are some things I'm simply not going to understand. And sometimes you have to be okay with not knowing. So God uses things that we may never fully understand in this life, but his promises remain. He is with you. Now, there's control and there's trusting God's plan. We like to be in control. That's how we are. That's how we feel safe. I'm in control, right? When we ride a horse, I don't know how many of you have ever been privileged to ride horses. I've been privileged to be able to ride horses lots of time. I know my sister-in-law had horses. She had Arabians and they were crazy. But then she had a beautiful, wonderful horse named Nev, who was so patient, and all the grandkids and the nieces and nephews used to ride on Nev. They were taught to respect her. She was elderly. But you know what? Nev was sweet. But you know what else? Nev, weighing thousands of pounds, could have squashed those little children like nothing. We have this this notion that we're in control, this illusion that we're in control. But here's the thing. Never at any point in time could have bucked any of us off. Even my, even my big behind could have bucked me right off and stomped me right on my head. Could have done it, but she didn't. We have this illusion of control. 
And we have that as it relates to God and living our lives. Instead of Jesus, take the wheel. We say, Jesus, that wheel is mine. You can't have it. Get your hands off the wheel. We often want to dictate the outcomes of our lives, our careers, our relationships, our health. But let me tell you what, this desire often conflicts with God's greater plan. Look, I don't want to be term leal. That's not something I love. Don't love that at all. Don't love this pain. I don't love this dysfunction. But you know what? God has a plan. I remember when they were putting me into the ambulance. They had just spent 40 minutes cutting me out of the car. I was crushed and mashed and messy and, oh, my lance, it was, it was horrible. I was in horrific pain, horrific pain. But let me tell you what, medical fentanyl, that helped me. That helped me. I, I'm just going to tell you right now, when she gave me that shot, I went from being in extreme pain to really not caring, whatever you want to do, I'm good. So I want to say, was there? I knew I was... Critically, I didn't know that I had died. I didn't know that I came back. I didn't know any of those things. I didn't have a a a conscious near death experience. I don't remember if if I had any. I don't remember it. But I remember everyone saying, "My lands, how's that guy alive?" All of the troopers, all of the firemen, all of the medical people. They said, "I can't believe you're alive. I cannot believe you're alive." Man, the big man upstairs, he must have plans for you. And I had the presence of mind. I thank God for this. Teeth all busted up, face all mushed, shoulder and left side. Oh, my goodness. Spinal cord injury, head injury, the whole deal. But I had the clarity to say, and I remember this vividly, God has a plan for all of us. It is up to us to live that plan. And then I quoted Avraham Heschel, something sacred hangs in the balance of every moment. Listen, we want to have control. We want to believe that we're in control. But let me tell you what, we're not. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in Adonai with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. Then he will level your path. He will level your path. In Hebrew, the word for trust is batach. It conveys a sense of complete reliance and confidence in God. But I completely rely and am confident in God. Not that I'm going to come through life without pain or suffering or loss, but that he has a plan. He has a purpose. And if I follow his will and I do what he tells me to do and I'm obedient to him, it's going to be all right. Relying on our own understanding. Listen, every time, relying on my own understanding, every time I've fallen short. And that's where we all fall short, when we rely on our own plans, our own mind. The ancient Hebrews understood this very well. They understand this as life is a journey. Jews understand this as life is a journey filled with uncertainty. Yet they will obey. Yet they also knew that true wisdom meant letting go of our attempts to control outcomes and trusting God's sovereign hand to straighten the crooked paths we face. Oh, I love talking about Avraham. I love in Hebrew when it, when it says, by faith. And then everyone, and it talks about the great, amazing thing that happened. Oh, my goodness, I love that. Avraham's story, it's such a powerful story. Even though it was he, his future was unknown, and many of folks don't know, Avraham was not a Jew. He became a Jew. Avraham's story is a powerful example of faith in the face of adversity. In Genesis twelve one through four, God tells Avraham or Abraham to leave everything familiar. Now Adonai said to Avraham. Get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, and away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. He doesn't say, go to that land over there, approximately that many steps, that many miles. He doesn't say, hey, it's going to take you 10 days, 30 days, 100 days, 10 years. He doesn't give him any details other than to say, leave everything you know. Leave it all. And go to a place that I will show you, and I'm not going to show you now. Lech lecha. The Hebrew word lech lecha 
means go for yourself. It's both a command and an invitation. This is why digging into the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek, so important. How many of you out there, maybe you're in chat, never knew that this is what it means. It means when he uses that word there, lechlecha, it means go for yourself. Get yourself out of your country. Everything he has known, away from your kinsmen, everyone he has known, he was widely respected and admired. And away from your father's house, that means from family. He had to leave everyone and everything and go to a land that he had never seen. And it was an everyday trip without a map. Lech lech ha, go for yourself. God didn't tell Abraham or Abraham exactly where he was going, but he called him to walk by faith. My new grandson, his first name will be Walker because of this. Walk by faith, trusting that God knew the way, even when he didn't. For us today, the challenge is similar. We might not see the full picture of our lives, but God does. Walking by faith, not by sight. Oh man, I have to cite 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But I'll go back to verse 6 because I, I don't want you to miss this. So we're all, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Oh, come on, let's listen to that again. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, I need you to understand this concept. We're almost finished. I need you to understand this concept. You walk by faith, not by sight. You, you, if we keep fighting and fighting and fighting God's will and fighting God's way, we say, that's not my way. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to live that way. But that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. This means relinquishing our need for control and trusting that God will guide us. Oh, we don't want to let go of control. Remember my little alteration to the song, Jesus, get off that wheel. This is my wheel. Don't take my wheel. I got the wheel. Meanwhile, we're crashing off in a ditch. We relinquish our need for control. And trust that God will guide us. Oh my goodness, that's so hard. Doubting God's presence in silence. Sometimes when the Father is silent, believers often feel abandoned. When God seems silent. When Hashem is silent. When Adonai is silent. We cry out in prayer. But sometimes the heavens seem closed. Listen, I wrote this because of a conversation I had with my dear friend. And I love him if you're listening now. I, I I love you, brother. I'm so happy you're okay. But this dear friend from way back, his life is so busy. His life is so complicated. He's got a lot of business things going and and a lot of family things going. And man, I got to tell you, I missed him. But he asked me, he's he the crying out, the quietness of God, the silence of God. This can lead to feelings of immense loneliness, frustration, and doubt. I don't know if you've ever been lonely. I talked about loneliness. Listen, I talked about uh, heroin and, and, um, and fentanyl. Those aren't the most dangerous substances in the world. Those aren't the most dangerous things in the world. The most dangerous thing in the world is our loneliness. Why? Because in our loneliness, we do things. We make decisions that are wrong that are harmful. I've done it. I've done it out of loneliness. We cry out in prayer, but sometimes the heavens seem closed. This can lead to feelings of terrible loneliness, frustration, and worst of all, worst of all, doubt. In Psalm 22, 1, David's lament is all too familiar. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from helping me, so far from my anguished cries? Listen, I want you to remember from the cross, Yeshua. Yeshua said in Aramaic, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Mm, 
If we don't know the Old Testament, how can we ever understand the New? Why, so far from helping me, so far from my anguished cries, David was saying, even Yeshua echoed, echoed these words on the cross, aligning with his own suffering. And David, they had something in common. Not just that he was in the line of David, as prophesied, but that they had suffered greatly. The Hebrew concept of Hester Panim, Hester Panim, or the hiding of God's face. Hester Panim. When we feel like God can't see us, when we feel like God is is gone from us. That feeling of, I, I don't know where he is, I don't know why I can't see him. It describes moments when God seems distant and hidden, or even though he's still present, we can't see him. David, like us, he wrestled with these feelings of abandonment, but by the end of the psalm, he reaffirms his trust in God's faithfulness. This teaching, oh, come on, such a beautiful teaching. This teaches us that God's silence is not his absence. How about Elijah? Elijah's experience hearing God in the Elijah, after a powerful victory over the prophets of Baal, flees in fear and depression. In 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, Elijah encounters God, not in the dramatic wind, earthquake, or fire, but in the gentle whisper. Oh, come on, hear this. Don't miss this. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, if you're taking notes. After the earthquake, fire broke out, but Adonai was not in the fire. After the fire came a quiet, subdued voice. That means, kol de mama dacha. Kol de mama dacha. Meaning, a still, a small, still. And it shows us that God's presence is often found in the quiet and the subtle, not in the spectacular. In our fast-paced world, we may expect God to respond to us loudly, but He often speaks through the silence. And He's inviting us to seek Him more deeply. The challenge of forgiveness, forgiving others. I just talked to somebody about this today. They said, hey, I'm not going to forgive them. I refuse to forgive them. I refuse. I'm not going to do it. Listen, forgiving others, especially those who have wronged us, Look, I did a I did a, a show on this, a message on this, um, how to forgive someone who who has harmed us greatly. Right? It's free. It's under the live tab. It's free, and then the audio only is is under the um, the other tabs, the videos and podcasts and all that stuff. And if you subscribe, you get all that. Forgiving others. I talk extensively about that there. It costs you nothing to listen to that teaching. That will help you. If you're struggling to forgive, that will help you. I assure you, it will. Forgiving others. The hardest part is those who have really hurt us deeply. It's one of the greatest challenges in the believer's life. Yet forgiveness is central to the gospel. In Colossians 3.13, Shaul or Paul exhorts us this way. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against someone else, forgive him. Indeed, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Oh, come on. It couldn't be any plainer than that. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against someone else, forgive him. Listen, stop picking apart the person. Stop picking apart the person. Stop picking apart everything they do. I'm convicted of that. I'm really, really working on that. Especially things they can't help. But even the ones that they intend, you've got to say, look, I've got to forgive them. Just as the Lord has forgiven me. So I must, the word here, so you must forgive. The Greek word for forgive is karezomai. Karezomai. This means to extend grace or to show kindness. A charismatic person is a person who extends grace and shows kindness. In the Hebrew culture, forgiveness, slicha, 
Slicha. It's an act of release. It's an act of release. It reflects the mercy that God has shown on us. When we forgive, we're releasing. We're not condoning the wrong done to us. No way. But we're releasing ourselves from the bondage of bitterness. Yeshua's example on the cross. The ultimate example of forgiveness is Yeshua on the cross. In Luke 23, 34, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. In the King James, you you might have rendered it this way. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even in his agony, in order for him to speak these things aloud, he had to push with his feet, which that giant spike was driven through, and he had to push against his back, against the rough-hewn wood. And he had to pull with the spikes between the bones in his wrist just to lift up, just to forgive us, just to forgive the murderers as they were murdering him. Why? Because we had no hope without that. We had no hope of salvation or redemption. Our Redeemer did that for us. He did it for you. When are you going to accept that? Listen, the world opposes the faith that I'm telling you to live. The world opposes it. The world's not for it. It makes fun of it. It says, man, you are crazy. Standing firm in our faith can be difficult in this modern world. It's often hostile to biblical values. We see, we see how Anna from the UK is telling us to pray for Tommy Robinson. The world is hostile. To our values, the pressure to conform to what the world says is normal and good and real, and it can lead to compromise. I want you to be a little easier on these stars that are secular stars, and then they come out and they say, I came to faith. Be a little easier on Russell Brand if he doesn't do everything just exactly how your church thinks he should do it. He's learning. Be a little bit kind with with Lauren Daigle. She's reaching tens of of millions for Christ. Be kind to Kat Von D. She's on a journey. Be gentle with her. Listen, they know, um, and and, and I got to tell you, uh, Jordan Peterson, it's very, look, he didn't need one more struggle, but a bunch of Christians throwing rocks at him. Be kind to those people. Be patient. In Romans 12, 2, Paul writes this. In other words, love when he says that. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standard of the olam hazeth. Instead, keep letting yourselves be be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Olam hazeth refers to this present world. Or the worldly systems that oppose God's ways. They are not for you. They are not for God. For believers today, listen, Paul's command is clear. Don't conform. Instead, let God's truth transform you into what he wants you to be. How much are we in this word that I just held up? How much are we in this word? How much are we on this phone with things that will lift us and and make us closer to God? I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's about the relationship with God. (coughs) Pardon me. You've got to let God's truth transform you. You've You've got to be in that word that helps you to have strength instead of caving to the pressure of the world. You've got to be in the word. Whatever way you can get it to you through this, through an iPad or, or a computer. And if you, it, it, I am a firm believer in at least having one printed copy of the Word. There's something about turning the pages. My wife can tell you I have every biblical program, every research program. I have a library of 2,744 books online. I have thousands of other books that are printed books. All of them, but there's something about having a Bible in my hand. And if you can't afford one, 
and you don't have one, or for whatever reason you can't get one, we'll see to it that you have one. How much are you in the Word? You say, I'm under such pressure from the world. How much are you listening to God's Word, praying, and meditating on His way? Daniel's faith in Babylon, my goodness. Daniel served as a profound example of standing firm in faith in Daniel 3, 16 through 18. When facing death for refusing to bow to an idol, Daniel's friends boldly declare, if our God whom we serve is able to save us, he will save us. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Let me say that again. Have you ever been in this place? Have you ever said, look, we're going to kill you? If you don't bow, Daniel and his friend said, if our God, whom we serve, is able to save us, he will save us. In other words, if you break that down, in other words, if he chooses to save us, he will save us. But even if he doesn't choose that way, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Let me tell you what. Their courage reminds us that faith requires standing firm, even when it comes at a cost. And as I close, listen, I need you to understand some very powerful things here. I need you to understand these things. It is so, so important. And those things are this. My friend, you need to understand finding strength in God's Word, the challenges of suffering, Control, forgiveness, and opposition are real, but the Bible offers us wisdom, strength, and guidance as we rely on God's promises, trust in His sovereign plan, and live out our faith. We'll find the strength of faith in these struggles. John 16, 33 reads this way, I have said these things to you so that united with me, you may have shalom, the absence of chaos. In the world, you will have sorus. But be brave. I have conquered the world. No matter what fire your faith is under today, remember Yeshua has already won the victory. Yeshua has already won the victory. Listen, November 3rd, I will be back with When God is Silent, Overcoming Doubt in the Desert Seasons. I am so looking forward to that. I hope that you've been blessed. I trust that you have. Leave us a note, obviously, on chat. People can't see that aren't on Facebook. They won't see that. But if you're on, on uh, or not on Facebook, but on uh, YouTube, the Dr. Sean, uh, the, the uh, True Word, Faith for Life with Dr. Sean channel, um, they, they don't see the chat after it closes. I don't know if there's a way to attach them. I love them. They're amazing, but I don't know how to do it. But listen, I want you to know, as you go on about your Sunday and you go on about your week, I want you to know, no matter what fire your faith is under, no matter what challenges you face, no matter what, Yeshua has already fought the battle for you. And on that I say, Shalom Elachum.